Welcome to Radical Engagements here at Varmvlog. And we continue with a discussion of Bertel Ullman's flag fetish and the illusory community. Done a little bit of research between this episode and the last one. Also let down my hair for those of you who are watching. The illusory community is actually a very interesting concept. The illusory community actually comes out of the German ideology. So we're going back to early Marx on this. And that is an interesting problem. This is um, this is actually in you know uh, part of the German ideology on Feuerbach opposition to materialist the opposition of the materialist and idealist outlook so that's where almond's pulling from i wish he cited it more but nonetheless i found out where he got it so just have that in mind that almond's not just asserting this in marx illegitimately all right um he talked about uh the way in which patriotism uh becomes a fetish for the real community or the social community as such. Um, and now we can see that also in the relationship of religion and Feuerbach. It makes sense that that's where this is discussed in Marx or Marx and Engels in this case too. Now we shall pick back up where we left off. The same pattern of relations as between uh, priest and society that we can see above it can be found in our political life where people in their capacity as citizens engage in a variety of alienated political activities and conditions in conditions and for ends controlled by others who have different and opposed interests in the political spirit the state is the alienated product to which citizens have transport transferred most of their powers above all their distinct human power to organize their own lives together as mutually dependent and cooperating members of society with all the thinking and feeling that goes into that then, as occurs with value in the economy and with God and religion, the human powers or abilities have metamorphosed into a variety of concrete forms. Institutions, constitutions, laws, traditions, and symbols like the flag, and again, the economic and religious spheres, that these forms are used to mystify and manipulate the very people alienated, whose alienated activity has given rise to them because they are under control of a small group, a political elite, in this case, who have interests opposed to theirs. And the most important of these interests is precisely the reproduction of the conditions to give them that control. Money, the cross, and the flag then are all products of alienated activities in different spheres of life, powers that mystify and dominate our existence, and some, quote, things in the saddle that ride mankind. That's a Tennyson quote, by the way. This is Warren talking. He cited it above. The role that symbols play as the chief mediators between the patriotic people and the community makes it appear over time that the symbols themselves have the power to dominate whatever it is they bring together. Marx refers to the natural, really supernatural, power that people attribute to such things as money, crosses, and flags as fetishes. Asterisk, based off of early anthropological conceptions that he was exposed to at the time. An asterisk. Back to the case. In every case, something was meant to mediate our connection to, interpret, and make available to us some part of the world that we deem necessary for our existence has taken on the appearance of a prime mover and people surrender to what they think to be its will. Rather than a symbol that points to the country, the flag comes to substitute for the country. So it moves from symbol to substitution, from symbol to fetish. It's that's just me explaining it, Roman. Back to the text. A recent letter to the New York Times admitted as much. A recent letter writer to the New York Times admitted as much when he declared his undying love for the country and the flag for which it stands. Again, when the New York Post announced in the front page headline on Iraq, they died for the flag, the claim was probably, and all too sadly, true. 
if the flag as a patriotic symbol reveals something about the country that is so vague and general that the people can view it as a social rather than illusory community in its role as a fetish, the flag blocks our view of the country altogether. In reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, for example, where the patriot pauses to consider its obviously false description of our country as one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all, brackets, the under God piece was inserted in the 1950s precisely as society was becoming more secular, editors. This oath begins, as you recall, with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The country for which it stands comes afterwards. Since the mental and emotional space put aside for the country had already been fueled by the flag, there's hardly anything that could be said about the country that would get our patriots' attention. Few things have frustrated and mystified radical critics, critics more than the indifference, not disagreement, but indifference to even the most damning facts about the country for which patriots are so willing to sacrifice. It is actually ironic how some of, some of the worst crimes aren't even denied. <laughs> the explanation lies in the essential fetishistic character of the flag and other patriotic symbols. The symbols, however, need to be interpreted. To say that they what they mean and what they require of us, there must always be a Wizard of Oz calling the signals from behind a drawn curtain. The government, and in the United States, particularly the president as head of state, are in the best position to be the voice of the flag. And as you know, or as we know, in class societies, the state does not serve everyone equally. Hashtag duh. And its main efforts are directed to helping the class that rules over the economy reproduce the conditions of its existence as a ruling class. But to do this job well, the state has to appear legitimate in the eyes of most of its citizens, which requires, above all, that its consistent bias on behalf of the capitalist ruling class be hidden from view. And any other classes that it protects as part of an elite, actually. Back to the face. The flag and the other patriotic symbols are crucial to the success of that effort. In the United States, the main force that legitimates our capitalist state are the Constitution, the Supreme Court, and the democratic elections, with the emphasis on little d democratic. Little d's added by me. But with the evidence of the pro-capitalist bias in the Constitution, Supreme Court, and elections so widespread and so easy to find, the government is in constant danger of losing its legitimacy, okay, like it is doing right now. Back to the text. It needs to function effectively. To forestall such a catastrophe, the government has to become very adept in using patriotic symbols as fetishes. In delivering all his public speeches standing before the wall of American flags, for example, George W. Bush was not only voicing what patriotic symbol would have us do, but also using it to legitimate his own right to speak on its behalf. It's perfectly circular. That's Warren Adams. Just before the outburst of patriotism that followed the events of 9-11-2001, the American state suffered its greatest loss of legitimacy in the history of the entire republic, the entire history of the republic. I'm not thinking only of its losing candidate being installed as president, but of a highly publicized vote fraud in Florida and straight political votes in the Supreme Court that sought to whitewash it. Neither the authority conferred by the democratic elections based supposedly on the principle of majority rule, nor the Supreme Court, based supposedly on the principle of rule of law, would play its customary role in legitimating the incoming administration. When we add the hundreds of millions of dollars of corporate money used to buy the election and Bush's non-existent qualification for the job, the new government probably had less legitimacy and with it less ability to promote its agenda than many of its modern predecessors. Perhaps no government in our entire history has needed an attack on our country so it could play the patriotic card so badly as this one. And it came, and as far as Bush's legitimacy is concerned, just in the nick of time. And historically, okay, I think we have to figure out this was written during the aughts and not when it was published, uh, where I can find it published in, in 2012. I think this means uh, a lot, but I think it's interesting to think about what this means now. We've had... Um, you know, since Bush has been in office, the Republicans have only won the popular vote once out of three times that they've been in office, and the Democrats have won the popular vote, but barely, so they're not out of it either. Patriotism and the rise of capitalism. Having described the nature of patriotism in general and how it actually works, we are now in the position to answer a few of the most frequently asked questions about it. One, 
What is the relation between capitalism, particularly democratic capitalism, and patriotism? Two, is there more patriotism in the United States than other capitalist countries? And if so, why? And three, based on this analysis, what political strategy should the left adopt for dealing with patriotism, particularly if not only in the United States? First, why does patriotism become so much more important under capitalism? The connection of patriotism with capitalism comes through the rise of the centralized state that the rising capitalist class requires to best serve its interests. In replacing the older and especially more feudal forms of political rule, the new state also overturned the main basis of their legitimation, the divine right of kings, tradition, and longevity. The divine right of kings is an early modern invention. Sorry, guys. I mean, it's kind of picked up from, like, James Stewart of England developed on through uh, Louis XIV, the Sun King. But in general, prior to that, that no, no king claimed true divine right. Although there was an, an idea that all governments in some way actually represented... Um, the the will of God, not because of the divine right, but because the there's a reflection of the archons of powers and you know, that God willed in whoever is in charge at any time as part of divine providence. So not quite divine right uh, kings, because that will was not absolute. But it's why, say, regicide was such a big deal in Christian cultures, as opposed to, say, Islamic cultures, where there is actually, even though there's less belief in free will, legitimate reason for uh, regicide and removing a caliphate, uh, a caliphate leader. So just take that in mind. Um, that's just a minor quibble. Uh, tradition and longevity are usually, you know, the reasons and that, that having a... Um, a royal above the nobility actually en enabled a unitary sovereign to adjudicate the the actual real power disputes between um, feudal lords who were basically warlords. You know, but anyway, back to the text. I just think that uh, Ullman's being a little bit too simple there. New forms of legitimization had to be found and and or constructed. Shared ethnic, religious, racial, or cultural characteristics were used whenever they existed. Hence nationalism, this is Warren talking. And why it's hard to like figure out exactly what nationalism is, because the basis of nationalism being ethnic, aka linguistic and cultural, religious, confessional, but also ethnic, racial, uh, which was invented simultaneously, like the whole concept is invented pretty simultaneous to um to ethnic and is slightly interchangeable, even though they're slightly different until the 19th and 20th century, where they become different. Our, rate, our, our cultural characteristics and cultural and ethnic are almost the same, but not quite, because you can be you can adopt a culture a little easier than you can adopt an ethnicity. Anyway, back to the text. Our cultural characteristics were used whenever they existed. To these were added, and whatever combination these qualities were allowed, a national identity came from simply living in a territory under the control of a particular state. Why do we refer to the U.S. as a nation state, since the United States people was never a nation in the European sense? This is why. This is Barn adding that. The purpose of the new identity was twofold, to help people distinguish themselves from those who lived across national borders, especially when ethnic, religious, or racial identities overlapped, and to hide, or to trivialize when it wasn't possible, the class divisions and conflicts within each society. If the first purpose received more attention, the second largely implicit aim has always been more important. When the class feeling becomes subordinate to the patriotic ones, could the class interest of the ruling economic class take on the appearance of the national interest and become a key part of everyone's national identity? But patriotism allows democracy to serve as the main legitimating mechanism in the capitalist period. Besides the repression that, the, that a staple of state activity in all class societies, which is all societies with states, a state requires the surplus to have a class of people to permanently administer the state and to deal out violence. So you have to have some kind of the ability to call up a, a readily available, if not permanently standing army. Uh, that's what Lenin says too. And a people to administer it, which is why a truly classist society, even in Marx and Lenin, 
is still ultimately one where most governance is not really maintained by a state as such. The capitalist state must also help its ruling class economic class to accumulate capital and realize value, self and its products. Not to do so is to risk the very future of the system. See what happens if GDP goes down, goes down negative for more than five years. Now, there's no rational reason why, why we have to base society off of GDP. That doesn't actually make sense. But see what happens in a capitalist society if the state allows that to happen. It'll, it doesn't last very long. But patriotism also allows democracy to serve as the main legitimizing mechanism in a capitalist period. Besides the repression of staple of class societies, the capitalist state must also help its ruling interest to accumulate capital and raise value, not to do so as a risk of the very future of the system, as I just read. The striking class bias displayed, particularly in the laws, judicial interpretations, and administrative decisions that flesh them out, is too dangerous to the interests that have come out on top to leave unattended. So in coordination with the rest of the conscious industry, the state does its best to disguise and naturalize its bias. And eventually, and most effective of all, to treat it as something freely chosen by the majority of people in the democratic election. How can one dispute what appears to be popular will? Yeah, this is why I'm speaking again. When people say it's our government, do not trust them. They're trying to get you to subordinate your will, to let someone represent you as if their interests are yours. If you cannot recall them and punish them for not representing your will, they do not actually have any incentive to represent your will. They have the incentive to represent those who would punish them. Otherwise, they have the incentive to represent their own. Furthermore, the distinctive manner in which a capitalist class extracts a surplus from those who produce all the wealth in our society through a free, quote unquote, exchange of labor, power for a wage, puts limits on the use of direct force in obtaining their ends. Thus, philosopher Stanley Moore has noted the tendency that, quote, when exploitation takes the form of exchange, dictatorship takes the form of democracy. Workers, simply put, must believe that they are free politi politically in order to in order for them to believe that they are free economically to accept or reject a wage in exchange for labor power. When all the economic pressures on the operating on them, this is only partly true at best, but in the presence of political democracy, this is enough for them to view their work relations as legitimate and to reproduce as much and as efficiently as they do. Thus, whatever democracy's many positive virtues, and despite all the popular struggles that help bring it to life, the main role of democracy in a capitalist era is to legitimate the existing social relations and the state's part in reproducing them. But if democracies really represent the popular will, how can capitalists be sure that, from their point of view, the people will act responsibly? The state's effort to ensure that no anti-capitalist party can win only provides further evidence for the partisanship that is trying to hide. Under these circumstances, and many on the left continue to wonder how capitalist parties, and in which I include most social democrats, so do I, Berta Ullman, so do I, that offer voters so much less than they want keep on winning all the elections. The answer, I believe, lies in their programs and that the flag and the patriotic symbols which these programs come wrapped. Most workers vote against their class interests because they love their country. Conditioned by early socialization and urged on by capitalist media, they feel it has a patriotic duty and the pleasure alienated though it be. It is in this way that patriotism allows democracy to do what capitalism requires of it. I think that's a little simple, Bertrand Omen, but I, I think in, in broad aspects is right. Second, why is patriotism seemingly a bigger problem in the United States than elsewhere? Why, long before 9-11 and in more or less peacetime, have Americans shown more devotion towards the flag than citizens of other capitalist countries? This, too, calls for an explanation. And, by the way, I'm going to say this, too, this too is also no longer true. A dissatisfaction with the American state is now universal to all partisans in the United States. In fact, like feeling like the government is somehow wrong is almost now part of American patriotism in a way that it wasn't when I was 20, which is about the time that Bertrand Armand is talking about. I will place the greatest weight on the fact that the United States, unlike most of its competitors, can never rely on a dominant ethnic, religious, or racial identity to provide the needed national cohesiveness. 
it tries to with race, but it doesn't really work. And particularly after Reagan's reforms of the immigration system in the 1980s. Why didn't we have a population problem before 2016? Why did the baby boomers not get unbalanced even before then? It was immigration. Anyway, although it tried to do to do so, our white nation, our Judeo-Christian nation, etc. This lets people sh a shared identity as citizens as the only workable basis for uniting them behind the government, and lets the government's outsized dependence on this political form of legitimation. Asterisk. And as it's failing, everyone talks about civil war, an asterisk. The U.S. Civil War brought the first great crisis in the national consciousness. Yes, and also finished the revolution, the bourgeois revolution, not ours. Both when the defeated Southerners and the newly free Blacks had great difficulty thinking themselves as citizens, taken together with a huge increase in immigration that occurred in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly from Eastern and Southern Europe, areas in which many people have begun to think of themselves in class terms and as socialists, it became evident that the state needed to do more, to get more directly involved in instilling a sense of national identity on which so much of its legitimacy depended. And this... It was during this period between the Civil War and World War I that I think most of our patriarch symbols, rights, and traditions were birthed and entrenched in our system of education. Yeah, that is where Thanksgiving comes from. A lot of our national mythology comes from. Although some of that stuff is still going on in like the New Deal to the 1950s even. So the consolidation of the, the invented tradition of the American Republic is remarkably more recent than most people realize. It is between the Civil War and 1955 when most of that is put together. And it's consolidated by, like, television and mass media more than just oral tradition or anything like that. All right, back to the piece. This is not very different from what football fans feel whenever the home team rises up from the standings. It's worth recalling, too, in this connection, the importance of mass spectator sports in American life. Oh, I skipped a paragraph. <sighs> It is in more recent times, especially after World War II, American patriotism receives a boost from two other features that set the country apart from the rest of the world. First is that the United States standing as the richest and most powerful nation in history, asterisk, after World War II, because of the destruction of the wealth of Europe, on asterisk, which makes it seem that the country, nation, state, government deserves all the praise we can offer and also gives its citizens the right and the duty to take pride in it and ourselves as part of it. And this is not very different from what football fans feel whenever their team rises to the top of the standings. It's worth recalling, too, in this connection, the importance of mass spectator sports in American life. The second feature that has become to distinguish our polity more and more is its belief in our country, no matter what party is in power, has always been in the forefront of the struggle for democracy, human rights, and freedom everywhere. Asterisk. This has been discredited by the period of which both the woman is writing about, so I don't think we believe that anymore. A lot of this veneer of patriotism has not been able to be maintained even by the patriots, quote unquote, themselves. Back to the text. So sometimes timing really matters in this. According to the prevailing ideology, the, these are the America's main exports to the rest of the world, even if the bloody record of U.S. imperialism with the festive Indian lands forward, and particularly today, presents evidence of the contrary. Some of this record even filters through the media and systems of education only get written off by most patriots as liberal propaganda, or if true, a minor temporary, the result of leaders' personal failings are a necessary step towards some greater human good. Did the patriots really believe then that our national interest coincides with what is best for the rest of the world? Leaving our rulers aside, I think most really do, and this belief provides a major rationale for their behavior. It also allows some patriots to use their universalistic religious beliefs to undergird their narrow national aspirations. The result of a unique mixture of naivete and self naivete and self righteousness that true believers miscontrol as idealism, and the world knows as American patriotism. The fact that the patriotic symbols, as we saw. Are also fetishes suggest what is involved. Who says fetish says alienation? And the enormous progress of American capitalism with its accompanying spread of commodification has extended the separation between each individual and his or her activity, product, and to other degrees realized nowhere else and produced the most alienated people in the world. Or the vanguard of alienation. And that alone are we exceptional. 
despite their influence or because of it, the painful isolation, constant competition, mutual indifference, and, and multiple disempowerment from which so many must suffer has given rise to an intense longing for community has nothing in their daily lives can satisfy, even more now than when this was written. There should be no surprise in the products of the alienated political activities, such as a flag, which still wear pale reflections of the community they have lost, should now exercise so much power over them. What do we do about it? American patriotism and nationalism does not have to remain a mystery. To briefly repeat, the country that patriots and nationalists say they love is essentially the social community, and the love they feel for it is akin to a yearning of solidaristic and mutual concern that characterizes the social community but has no place in the illusory one. The patriotic national symbol, particularly the flag, the government of the illusionary community is able to redirect these sentiments into the support for the legitimacy and political agenda. This, by the way, is where anti-political Marxism kind of comes from, which is the idea that politics, because it represents a class interest, is a natural limitation to class politics itself. And thus, social movementism is actually where class politics resides. I don't agree with this, but I'm just telling you, it is this distinction that both Armin is playing with, although used in a different way, where that kind of political ideology comes from. It goes back to the German ideology. You can also see why structuralist Marxist and scientific Marxists really hate this, because it makes their whole monopoly state developmentalist theory real hard to believe. And really consistent with elements of Marxist thinking. And not just these early elements, frankly. Go back and re-critique at the Goethe program and see where it also applies there, even though it's different in how it's articulated. Crucial to the success of this effort is the dual character of symbols as both fetish as both symbols and fetishes. I asked at the outset, is this too great a version for these fetishes to bear? Asterisk. Yes, it was. And here we are now in the social media ash wasteland. <laughs> Left over from it. But Berto Orman couldn't know that when he wrote this piece. At the bullseye of our target is the state and the class character of chief institutions, aim, uh, agents, aims, and rulings and effects. After identifying the core emotions found in patriotism and nationalism, let's show how they find their expression in fetishes manipulated by the government of the woke 1%. This tells us when this was written. You can tell that this was mostly written during the Bush administration, but actually was published in lieu of Occupy in 2012. I mean, the timing of this is a little bit telling, right? Walter Arman was clearly playing with these ideas before that because he's not making reference to the Obama administration or Libya or any of that stuff at all. It's all stuff from the prior decade, which we're now 20 something years removed from. Um, although this is the story of my adult life, so I feel it. At the bullseye of our target is the state and the class character of this gene's institutions, agents, aims, rulings, and effects. After identifying the core emotions found in pictures of nationalism, we must show how they find expression in the fetishes manipulated by the government of the 1%. There is so much that we could do to trivialize, ridicule, disparage, and replace many of the interdependent elements found in patriotism and nationalism in all sorts of venues, and particularly the schools. I'm under no illusion that today's left is in the position to take full advantage of these tactics. And we're still not. All right. Sorry. Nor is it that we must do encountering the threat of growing patriotism, nationalism, or even that this is our most important task right now. Given the importance of this ideology to the capitalist class rule in general and the Washington's version of this rule in particular, anything we can do to weaken its hold on the people will repay our efforts a thousandfold. May, June, 2012, against the current issue 158. I'll put both links in the show notes. I think this, you know, I think this is a little simple of an outline, but for an article about how the fetish character of symbols can come to actually drive thinking as well as emerge from power relationships and economic power relationships in particular is really useful. Um, and it really makes a lot of the national methodological limitations of leftists seem all the more farcical since we don't have this patriotism to appeal to, but we're also seemingly stuck in these national frameworks. It's a real problem. And it's not just the anarchists who notice it. 
And as a crisis gets down and we are more alienated, it's more likely for us to reach to imagine communities to fill in the solid, solidaristic human need. And this is why I think, you know, I am I am obviously not a person who thinks everything Marx ever said was right or coherent with itself. But this is why early Marx is actually still pretty fucking important. Anyway, like and subscribe. Hit the bell. Find us on Patreon. Look in the show notes. Find where we're at. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.